Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm Roger Zakheim, director of the Reagan Institute, the home of the Reagan Foundation in the nation's capital. We're coming to you live across the street from the White House in our Sutton Family Auditorium. I hope everyone enjoyed St. Patrick's Day, and uh, I hope you've fully recovered. Our 40th president loved St. Patrick's Day. It was a day to celebrate his Irish roots and, and to have some fun. Uh, of course, this love of the Irish is on display at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley with uh, the Reagan Pub. And it's true that a pub was originally found in Ireland, President Reagan's ancestral homeland, and it was moved piece by piece to California. Alas, this year we could not host our guest today at the pub in the Reagan Library due to the pandemic, but we're bullish we'll be able to do so at the Reagan National Defense Forum this December. But that's not why we're here today. We're not talking U.S.-Irish relations or the Reagan pub, but we are talking defense policy, and we are very excited to welcome Representative Mike Rogers of Alabama. Congressman Rogers has served in the Congress since 2003. He takes keen interest in military issues, and for good reason. His district is home to Anniston Army Depot, Maxwell Air Force Base, and Fort Benning. Many of you may not know that that runs along the border with Georgia. Congressman Rogers is the ranking member on the U.S. House Armed Services Committee, where he's identified his top priorities as ensuring a strong defense budget and countering the threat of an assertive China. He's also one of, if not the greatest champion of the Space Force. We share those priorities, Congressman, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Recently, the Reagan Institute released the results of our latest Reagan National Defense Survey. And two of the key findings were declining trust in the U.S. military and rising concern amongst Americans about China. More than one-third of Americans now see China, not North Korea, Iran, or Russia, as the greatest threat to the United States. So we're very interested in your thoughts on those issues, Congressman. But first, the floor is yours. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, from Alabama's third district, U.S. Representative Mike Rogers. advancing the values of freedom and democracy abroad and maintaining the peace through our strength. The people of Alabama's third district wholeheartedly agree with that and I've been sent to DC to uphold those values and leadership ideals. And I plan on doing just that as a ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, we cannot assume President Reagan's vision will just continue. We must advocate to be the beacon of freedom. Uh, the world is a different place uh, than in the beginning of this century. Uh, we have fought a war on terror. We are facing rising peer competitor, competitors, both militarily and economically. Uh, we are confronting and hopefully defeating the, a virus that has brought the world to a halt. Uh, this is, in my opinion, pandering to the left without, um, under, without understanding the ramifications of what he's calling for. Yet he's not alone in calling for cuts uh, just two days ago, 50 Democrat House members wrote uh, to Biden urging him to submit a budget that reduces defense budget. In fact, even House Democrats, uh, uh, even a House Democrat was on that letter, the House Democrat. Uh, this is a real threat to the Pentagon's budget and makes working with NDA even harder. But I'm certain that the National Defense Authorization Act or defense appropriations with cuts will not pass the House of Representatives. House Republicans just won't go along with that, and I don't believe the majority of Democrats will either. The Bipartisan National Defense Strategy Commission recommended an annual 3 to 5 percent increase in defense spending above the rate of inflation uh, in the defense budget for, so, for the foreseeable future. The uh, and I agree with that recommendation, and, I, and in fact, my colleagues and I have written to the President suggesting that he hit that spending uh, proposal. 
I also believe that the vast majority of the congressional Republicans support an annual increase of 3 to 5 percent and will want to see that in the NDA uh, brought to the House floor for consideration. I know that, House, that members of the House Armed Services Committee, in a bipartisan manner, are taking the threat of China very seriously. We will not allow China to become our peer militarily. Uh, we will do everything we can to ensure the DOD can outpace the PLA in abilities and capabilities. To confront the rising China, we're going to have to make decisions between legacy platforms and new technologies. Uh, those are going to be hard choices for Congress, but I'm willing to lead on those decisions. We must support our strength and requis with the re requisite resources. Nukes. Peace through strength comes from strategic capabilities that we possess. Specifically, our greatest deterrent of a confrontation with China and Russia is our nuclear arsenal. And I can't reaffirm this more. It is critical to our nation's security that we continue nuclear modernization. This includes all three legs of the nuclear triad, its weapon systems, weapon production, and nuclear infrastructure. Iran is ramping up its research and development on its nuclear program and pushing limits that are concerning to the international community. It would be a fatal strategic mistake for us to lose our deterrence capability. The Obama administration even understood this. The Trump administration took steps to execute this. It is incumbent on the Biden administration to complete this <clears throat> with necessary resources for DOD and the National Nuclear Security Administration. <clears throat> the other thing I will add is that some on the left believe the U.S. should adopt a no first use or sole purpose policy. Uh, this is mis a misguided and ultimately dangerous position. It is not supported by our allies in Europe or in the Pacific and artificially limits our ability to provide for a credible deterrent capability. Space. Now, I can't afford to an miss an opportunity in front of a captive audience to speak about something I care a lot about, and that's the Space Force. Space is something that affects every American, whether they realize it or not. Uh, if we can harness the innovation of this commercial sector, we can make sure we outpace our competitors in this new war fighting domain, uh, and that's what this is all about. So thank you for letting me be here with you. I look forward to the Q&A with Roger, and uh, I'll move over to that position. Well, <clears throat> Congressman, uh, thanks for those remarks. Um, I think it's the first time I've heard you speak publicly outside of the hearing room uh, since you've become ranking <laughs> member. Uh, you slot in quite well. Seem quite comfortable in the role. Thank you. I am comfortable in it. Been working for it for a long time. I, I know. I know you have. Um, and of course, it's not your first uh, time serving as in the head of a committee, as you, right. with the Homeland Security Committee. But different committees, isn't it? Very different. And uh, and I really enjoy this work, as you know. This is this is my wheelhouse. National security issues. So Homeland Security was a good fit. Uh, but with the border crisis Biden's created, I'm kind of glad I'm on the Armed <laughs> Services Committee working with our challenges. Sometimes it's good to get away with those issues, <laughs> right? right? They're exhausting. Um, all right, well, we'll keep it focused on defense issues now. Uh, as, as we both reference in, in, in remarks, we, uh, Reagan Institute put forward the National Defense Survey. Um, and one of the things that came out of that survey on the defense budget is that three-quarters of Americans favor increasing defense spending or keeping at the same level or more. Um, this is contrast with where Bernie Sanders in or the Senate Majority Leader Charlie Schumer who are advocating or support a 10% cut across defense. We have a, a CSBAS exercise we did with the uh, prominent think tank in, in D.C. Uh, that looked at what an impact of a 10% defense cut would be. Your remarks showed a lot of confidence that the Armed Services Committee uh, will not support any cuts to the defense budget. Is that just a function of votes that it's such a narrow uh, Democratic majority in the Hask, or does the viewpoint of maintaining or increasing the defense budget really run deep within the committee? Well, it runs deep on the Republican side of the committee, um, but it's more a function of votes. You know, w fortunate we have, as you know, a, tr uh, a long tradition of passing the National Defense Authorization, uh, 60 years, consecutive years. Nobody wants to be responsible for being the, the Congress that doesn't meet that. Uh, that tradition. Uh, and, and it also is important for us, no matter whether Democrats in power or Republicans, 
to make sure our men and women in uniform know we got their back. And so we're going to get it done. And because the, the narrow majority uh, the Democrats have, uh, we're going to have a big influence on the Republican side in making sure that that, that number stays uh, healthy. Uh, and I, I caution people about the, the number staying healthy. They can come in with a number that, say, uh, is level funding, which basically means last year's number plus inflation, right. uh, and say, well, that, that ought to be okay with you. It might be unless they go and they put a whole bunch of money in, in the budget for climate change and, and other things that, that are not defense-oriented. That's not going to make the mayor try. We're going to have to have a strong defense number that's targeted toward defense. And if they want to put some more money on top for things like that, that's going to have to be on top so, of it. So what you're talking about right now is what happens beneath the top line. Right. And, and there's difference in priorities. And it seems to be, I guess, they're signaling that they want to allocate some of the defense dollars into a priority, a priority of theirs like, like climate change. Um, where are you concerned they'll take that money from? You know, where, where do you think the vulnerable points are? You mentioned strategic forces, for example, in your remarks. Is that one place you think they're going to kind of take money from to advance and invest in their own priorities? That's where they will try to take money from. Now, we intend, we're, we're on top of that. We're not, we're not going to let it happen. You know, again, we're a very bipartisan committee, so I mean, we're going to work together. This is not going to be all that adversarial. But there'll be some, some mischief and efforts by the administration to do things like that. They're already signaling it. You know, the fact is, while Biden historically has been a relatively moderate uh, legislator, uh, he's, in, he's not in control. I mean, the, le the left is in complete control of his administration. And uh, they're, they're, I think you're going to see their fingerprints on, on efforts in the defense to bu budget that are not going to be received well by us. Well, let's talk about that, uh, that characterization of the Biden administration, because we have Secretary Austin, of course, running the Department of Defense. Uh, you have a relationship with him prior. Good relationship. Uh, a good relationship. So tell us about the bipartisan relationship, not we were talking about the Armed Services Committee or within the Armed Services Committee. What about your relationship uh, with the Department of Defense and the Secretary? How's that going? I have a great relationship uh, with the secretary, and when we, when he came before us about getting his waiver, you know, that, that he had to get a waiver uh, to take the secretary. Right, he wasn't seven years out of the military. That's right, and uh, one of the, in fact, the number one question I asked him was, uh, I, I made reference to the uh, National Defense Strategy Commission's recommendation on three to five percent increases, which his predecessors had supported and ask if that was his position. Hmm. And he said it was his position. It's going to be his recommendation to the president. Uh, so I like that, and I think he, he meant it. The, but now that's not something he said publicly. Uh, I mean, he said something like that, I guess, at his hearing. At his hearing, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, he has not been back before us in a public hearing since right. then. But the thing that I have to keep in my mind is that's his position. He works for the president. <laughs> so, right. Uh, while he may be for a three to five percent increase, if Biden says it's not going to happen, he has to, you know, follow his boss's orders. And you don't seem too optimistic that's going to happen. That's not what you're getting out of the White House or the Office of Management and Budget. We don't know what's coming from the White House. My guess is that Biden is going to be under tremendous pressure to cut the budget, and I, I'm expecting him to come with level funding. It's kind of a middle. You think it'll be level funding? Thing. You know, and all this talk about budget, you know, it doesn't kind of stand in a vacuum. You've mentioned a few times in this conversation in your remarks the national defense strategy. Um, it is that strategy that when you look at the requirements dealing with China, which we'll get to in a minute, of course, dealing uh, with, with Russia and then the other threats, Middle East, Iran, uh, that requires that level of investment. Uh, tell us about your conversation with Secretary Austin and his commitment to the national defense strategy. Well, he does, and I think he genuinely is committed to it. Uh, what I'm bothered by, again, is not him, mm -hmm. but there are those in the administration that want to revisit the national defense strategy and basically write a new one that comports with their perspective. And I don't, I, I, that's not going to go over well with us. I mean, the threats are the threats, and, and we've got to, to, to meet those. And the fact is, is as you said, we're going to talk about China. China is an ominous threat, and, and they are spending much more in growth every year than, than we have been, and we will have to meet that, that challenge, and it's going to require a lot of, ex, uh, of expenditures uh, around the world. But, you know, we just had the new uh, uh, Pacific Defense Initiative. Indo-PACOM uh, commander Indo came and testified, right. And, I mean, he's talking about some real challenges that we have to get after now. 
So these are not things that are just like esoteric thoughts. Right, right. These are things that we've got to do. They're, they're major investments, major commitments, and you've got to stick to it year over year. Uh, you mentioned that you're concerned that the national defense strategy will change. People want to rewrite it. Um, in your remarks, you said, quote, uh, if it would be a fatal strategic mistake not to continue the investment in the modernization of our nuclear weapons. sounds to me that you think that's one of the things that they would change from national defense strategy. And I just note that the national defense strategy prioritized uh, modernization of nuclear weapons. It became a key area uh, for investment in order to realize uh, our objectives in that strategy to deal with China and the other threats. Yep. And, and what we have found is every defense secretary in recent years has reaffirmed that. Even ones who came into the position not strong on the triad. Within six months, they had done an about face. It is a very effective deterrent, and it's worth every penny that we spend. And people have to remember, it's only 6% hmm. of defense spending, this modernization. Right. Effort. So it's not a huge chunk, and there is no better money that we spend. It has bigger bang for the bunk. And, and that would be an bunk. area that is a point of difference between you and, and the chairman. Correct. Uh, you're a big believer in the triad, and particularly someone who thinks that the ground-based nuclear right. deterrence, the GBSD, is, is meritorious and should continue to have the support of uh, the defense budget. Chairman Smith has taken a different view. How do you, how do you see that playing out? Uh, we're going to win. <laughs> I mean, I like Adam. He's my, he's my buddy. Uh, and he feels strong about getting rid of, of, of that leg of the triad. And, but he's making a run at it every year, and he loses the vote. I mean, all the Republicans oppose it, and half the Democrats are with us on this. So uh, he'll make another good run at it this year, and it's genuine on his part. But uh, it is a very effective deterrent, and we're going to fund it. It's modernization. Let's talk about China. You mentioned it a couple of times. Do you see... Big shifts or smaller shifts in the approach to China by the Biden administration? Of course, the Trump administration, one of its most important uh, kind of legacies is their national security strategy, national defense strategy, which said China is the pacing threat. There's been continuity with that uh, when you listen to the president speak, the secretary of state speak, the secretary of defense. What concerns you? What reassures you about the way they're talking about China? Uh, I'm still apprehensive about the approach the Biden administration is going to take with China. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned that they uh, are not going to be as, as uh, hardline as the Trump administration was about the role that China is playing in the world. And I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I'm still a wait and see mode. I haven't heard the kind of things that assure me of strength and, mm. and determination when it comes to taking on China. And, and a good signal is going to be this defense budget. If, if they send a good number that shows they're serious about funding uh, the military to, to meet the challenges that China's presenting around the world, then I'll have confidence they're serious. But if they send over a weak number, it shows that they are not taking the, the threat seriously. Well, I'll play devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, you know, Senate Majority Leader, for example, yesterday made that same exact point on the, on the Senate floor, that the best test for our, commi you know, uh, our, our commitment to this strategy and to confronting and challenging China is the defense budget. What about something you'll hear, and you've had uh, current administration officials write about this prior to their entry into this administration that says, hey, we can go ahead and, and confront China, compete with China, make the investments we need for defense to deal with China, but we could still keep the defense budget flat or go down because there are other areas in the world where we can invest in less or do our business differently. They'll point to the Middle East. Even some Republicans would take this view. Let's not spend money in Afghanistan. Let's not have the force presence we have in the Middle East, and yet you know, still deal with China in the fashion that you're talking about. How do you respond to that approach? It's naive. Uh, it's I, naive, you're saying? It's naive, yeah. If anybody thinks that we can just move away from the, the challenges that we face in the Middle East, they're just being naive. You know, I, I, just look at what Iran's doing now. You know, it, they're always up to mischief over there. It's a very volatile part of the world. You know, while we are turning some of our attention away from Eastern Europe, it's naive to think we can just ignore that. Uh, Russia is not going to just be passive and, and not be a problem. So, you know, people just ignore these challenges as well. I'll let you put that mic back on. Um, you know, you mentioned Russia, um, you know, one of the challenges that we saw when we collaborated with the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments in this 
exercise looking at what happens with a 10% cut is that you essentially have to pick theaters. Mm -hmm. You have to pick a region that you're going to focus on. Uh, sounds to me that your view is while China is a priority, the U.S. still needs to be leading both in terms of political leadership but also security leadership in Europe and Middle East as well. Did I get Absolutely. that right? Absolutely. You know, the fact is if we were to take our eye off Eastern Europe, you know, Russia's aggression would move right across Ukraine uh, into the Baltics. They, they are not through. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we've got to pay attention to all. I, what I keep emphasizing is the big emphasis has to be on China because of how aggressive they are around the world. You know, people just have, that aren't paying attention to it would be surprised at, at what a threat they are. And, you know, and we just had a, a, a classified briefing a couple weeks ago from the Office of Net Assessment that, that looked at war games with China. And it's an ugly picture uh, for both countries, uh, but it was very sobering. And, I, you know, I hate that the public can't know more about some of these things because it would be sobering for them uh, to know uh, what's going well, on. Well, I mean, what we've seen from our annual survey is that actually Americans are increasingly becoming familiar with this. Yeah. Um, just a year ago, they would have said Russia was the greatest threat facing the United States. Now in our survey, they say China. So kind of the mindset of the American people seems to be uh, following the mindset of, of, of experts like you and, and others who, who follow this closely. Let's talk about the intersection of China and technology. Um, we saw something interesting in our survey that only 39 percent of Americans believe the U.S. military is the most technologically capable in the world. And I say the most technologically capable, right, because when it involves competition uh, and national security, being one of the best is not a recipe to winning. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing on the Armed Services Committee? You focus on this bringing in new tech uh, into the military to get at this to make sure that not only in deed, but in mindset, the U.S. military is the most technologically capable military force in the world. Yeah, that is just the topic right now for, for me. Uh, we, as, as you know, Space Force, establishment of the Space Force was just on the, the tip of the iceberg on what we have to do as far as modernizing the military with technological capability. Next, you're going to see us turning to cyber and AI. Uh, we just had a great hearing a couple weeks ago. Uh, looking at innovations that we intend to, to bring about. Uh, Eric Schmidt's commission yeah. uh, brought a report to us, and one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that we don't have a, a technologically qualified workforce to meet with the cyber challenges, because that is that is an area of real vulnerability. Can't we us. just outsource it? Why, why yeah. do we have the work? Why do we need the workforce? How are we going to get that workforce? Especially? Well, that's, that's the thing. Is what they are recommending is that we stand up a digital service academy. Uh, and it'd be just like the military academies, service academies we have now where somebody comes in, we can train them free of charge, but they've got to work for the Defense Department uh, or the government. It could be somebody from Treasury or DHS, whatever. Uh, they, they spend two years, five years, whatever, getting their, their education. Then they work five years for the government, uh, just like somebody would do in the military. Uh, this is exciting, and, and we're, we are going to stand it up. We're going we're gonna to get after this, and it will be for people who want to get maybe a certificate or it could be a two-year training or a four-year ma or a master's degree or Ph.D. Uh, but in the interim, while we're standing this up, we're looking at scholarship opportunities for people to go into existing universities, great universities like Auburn, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and get the same cyber or AI training. Uh, again, in exchange for working for the government. So this is something that we're getting after because we not only have this problem in the, in the government, it's in the private sector. Absolutely. We don't have enough people that are trained in this, in this area, and, and we're getting after it. So I think that you're going to see, as this comes about, more people being excited about working for the government. Well, certainly if you pay for the education, that's a model right. before, and then you're not asking for a career, but you're asking for a certain number of years. In fact, the Reagan Institute did a task force with Bob Work, who also co-chaired right. our task force and, and the AI Commission with Eric Schmidt. Uh, so there are some existing programs in the defense authorization Already. bill that do that, but this sounds uh, quite significant, the Digital uh, Service Academy. So um, it's very bipartisan. When it, this, mm. this, this report was incredibly well received by the committee, and, and uh, it's another example of how our committee is different from the others in that we, we take these challenges in a nonpartisan fashion and take get Do you think them. we're spending enough in the defense budget? on things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. A lot of attention, a lot of ink spilled on this. But if you look at the dollars, 
it's not really kind of commanded. Yeah. And this was one of the first things I talked about uh, when I talked to the steering committee in pursuit of this job. Steering uh, committee, the people who decide who's their chairman or ranking members right. on, the, on the Republican uh, side. I, okay. This was my emphasis about changing the culture on the committee and in the department. And when I got the job and talking with the Republican members, uh, we have to change the way we think. Uh, and, and I've talked with many of the defense contractors about this too. Uh, we're going to have to move away from these legacy platforms and move into new technical capabilities. And people have to be okay with change. And people don't take change well. It's right. just not human nature. But we have to, to, to think differently uh, and reward innovation and risk taking in the department. And that is a big, difficult challenge. Uh, as you know from being on the committee, uh, the Pentagon doesn't like change. Uh, they move very slowly, but we're going to have to try to build that culture to where we're expecting innovation and risk taking. And if you're not taking risk and failing every, every once in a while, you're not taking enough risks. You, you, you use this language of moving away from legacy systems. Um, two points on that. The administration put out a, not a national security strategy, they're still developing it, but a kind of interim guidance. Uh, much of it was outside or not directly uh, impacting the Pentagon, but they use that same language about moving away from legacy systems. Um, does that assure you or concern you that's what they're focusing on when they talk about uh, the Pentagon and the defense budget? I think everybody won't, talks the game, mm -hmm. but it's doing it's going to be different, just like establishment of the Space Force. The Air Force fought tooth and nail to prevent that from happening until ultimately it was obvious it had to happen and, and, and they got behind it and made it successful. The, the efforts to change the culture in the Pentagon are going to be painful. People don't want to change. Same thing with members. This literally is, is so funny. When we were in this briefing on, by Net Assessment Office on yeah. the challenges with China, they talked about it at, at the conclusion about the vulnerabilities we had that we were going to have to move away from legacy platforms and move into new technologies, information technologies. And literally during the Q&A, members got up who had those legacy systems built in their districts and saying, well, we don't need to go too fast. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's predictable. Absolutely so predictable. That's the thing I'm, I, I, I want people to understand. We got to shake that loose and recognize that, that wars of the future are going to be fought very different. Space Force is an example. Whether people realize it or not, we are heavily dependent on space to fight and win wars right now. We're heavily dependent on space in our daily lives, and people don't realize it. Same thing's going to be true of cyber and AI. We have got to position ourselves to be competitive in battle in that space, and that means we're going to be moving away from some of the stuff we've depended on in the past. I want to drill down on this a bit more because clearly expert, you're clearly expert in, in the national security issues and the defense issues and, and direction we need to go. But you're also expert, I know you, in politics and how to get agreements and how to move forward. And I think most experts would agree that the Armed Services Committee is as successful as they've been in getting a defense bill. They've been less successful in moving away from legacy platforms, for example. And the reason is, is what you've, you've identified. Part, they're, they're carrying out missions today. People don't want to give up deterrence today for something that's not proven, that we'll get at a date later. Mm -hmm. People aren't confident they'll get it later either. Right. Um, and also because it's jobs and workforce in districts. Yep. Are you going to take a different approach to try to work with those members and those uh, contractors that, you know, the business is built on a legacy system? Yeah, I have already been talking with the CEOs of all the major defense contractors uh, and telling them, understand this, we don't build anything. We buy things from you. So you have to set the tone that it's okay to change because the things that we move away from, you're going to build the new things that replace them. So help us make these changes. And, I, and it's been received pretty well. Now, it, we'll see how it's received when we start talk, when we quit, quit preaching and go to meddling with their programs. <laughs> <laughs> then all of a sudden the view will change. Yeah, we'll see. Let, let, let's hit on Space Force for a second, and, and it gets to the politics of Space Force. Um, it was obviously a huge uh, a priority for the Trump administration. Uh, but by the end of the administration, it seemed to have be something that had a lot of bipartisan support. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, a press over uh, the White House uh, communications director comments about Space Force and whether that reflected uh, a Biden administration view that the Space Force was less of a priority.
do you still have those concerns? You obviously responded uh, to that, but uh, is that something you're concerned about? No, I, I knew the Biden administration. I'd already gotten signals behind the scenes that, that they were supportive of it. Because the fact is, this was not Trump's program. I, the president was very helpful to us in the end of, of getting it through the Senate. But this had come through the House already uh, before the president had ever heard of it. Uh, we had, uh, had passed it in a bipartisan fashion out of the House Armed Services Committee, out of the House of Representatives. The Air Force fought it tooth and nail in the Senate. And uh, it was the president who then, uh, the next year, helped us get it through the Senate. Uh, the problem we had with some of the politics is that many people thought it was the president's idea on the Democrat side. Sure. So if it was Trump's idea, they were against it. Right. And... Uh, Fortunately, you know, when uh, when it came up again the next year in, in the House, Adam Smith did a great job of helping the Democrats understand uh, that aren't on the committee. This had nothing to do with President Trump. This was this was a bipartisan initiative that had to be dealt with militarily, and uh, he got and he got it, got the support of the Democrats. So uh, that had already gotten behind. But the, this Jen Psaki was part of this larger culture of people that just thought it was Trump's idea and didn't understand it was a serious initiative. It's a bit of education here for, for everybody. Everybody. And, you know, I had a, uh, another conversation yesterday with General Raymond about this, the Chief of Space Operations. He and General Hyten, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, have been aggressively working uh, to try to declassify a lot of what uh, we're doing in space and the Chinese and Russians to help the public understand what this is all about. The public doesn't really know this is about satellites. They, right. they don't know. And it's very, very overclassified. And the more information we can get out, and, and they're, they're getting after it, there's going to be a lot more coming out about what China's doing, what Russia's doing, and what we're doing. Uh, the public is going to be very uh, interested and appreciative of the effort that we've been doing. Well, I mean, clearly, as we look at this tech revolution, space is, is capturing the minds and imaginations of America, Americans, particularly with what's happening on the commercial side. But it sounds like one of the priorities for the Space Force right now is to really demystify, declassify uh, how this is relevant to, to the future of warfare. Um, as you think about this year and the, and the coming years, I'm noticing your space socks, by the way. There we go. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we get a zoom in on that. But, uh, I had my Space Force cufflinks I, 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 on yesterday. I, I'm not surprised to hear that. Um, what is the priority uh, for, for the year and next couple of years for the Space Force? What do you want to see them do? Declassification seems to be one of the things you're emphasizing. What else? That's the number one thing. The second thing, that, and that's what I talked about with General Raymond yesterday, is we're trying to stand up their, their new acquisition structure to be very agile and fast and because it, it's going to set the example for other services about what can be done. And I see this as an exciting opportunity because it's a brand new service. As I told the general, uh, you got a blank chalkboard. Right. You can do it the right way from the beginning and, and do it right. And plus, oh, it's a small service. You know, this is not about bulk. This is small about right now, small. but the, the big concern is that, you know, nothing in the Pentagon stays small for long. You think you keep it? Oh, yeah. Small? I think it's going to stay relatively small because it's about what's between your ears up here. It's not about brute strength. So it doesn't have to be a big service. It's got it. And it's the cool service. So all these young people, these smart young people want to be in it. I mean, we're already seeing it at the Air Force Academy. These, these, these graduates are wanting to go into the Space Force instead of the Air Force. So uh, this is a chance to, to show how it can be done right, how uh, procurement and acquisition can be smart and be fast. So I'm excited about it. Now, he's getting after it with a, with a, a keen eye toward keeping it fast. What does fast mean? I mean, in, in the world of the commercial world, fast is months. In, in, the, in the Department of Defense, anything less than a decade is fast. So what does fast mean for the Space That's Force? That's a great question. Uh, I would like to see us move at the speed of commercial. Wow. And what we found in, in the commercial sector is they can generally move from concept to getting a product in space in 18 to 24 months. Uh, we've been six to eight years. Uh, in, the, in the Defense Department. I want to see us move 18 to 24 months from, from the time a COCOM says he's in the capability to getting that in space, and maybe faster, because we're finding in the private sector they're starting to go faster than that. So there's no reason why we can't, with this new service, uh, move it at that same speed. That's the election cycle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. 18 to 24 months. We can actually come back and, and, and see the results. Uh, we have a, a, a few more minutes. I um, want to talk about uh, a new task force that the House Armed Services Committee has launched, uh, co-chaired by Congresswoman Slocken and Congressman Gallagher, focusing on uh, emerging tech supply chains um, and manufacturing. 
why is this a priority? I assume you share the priority with, with the majority on this. Uh, tell me about this manufacturing element. The Reagan Institute's uh, uh, working on this. We'll be launching something along these lines as well. But I want to hear uh, what your view uh, and why this is an area of emphasis. Uh, well, one of the things this pandemic has taught the whole country is we are way too reliant on China in our supply chains for everything. Uh, and we as a nation have to repatriate a lot of the production of things uh, as a nation if we want to be secure. And I think we're working toward doing that. This is just another indication that we're doing the same thing in the military. We have got to get China out of our supply chains. And, and and it's going to be painful for some of these defense contractors who don't want to have to be disrupted, but we intend to do it. And this is bipartisan. It's going to we're going to you're going to hear some some kick dogs yelping, but we intend to get China out of our supply chains. And and you're saying it's painful for the contractors because you're going to require them to go deep into their supply chain where they right now don't have to look. Right, and find alternatives, and uh, they're not going to want to do that but we're not going to really give them a choice. What's the government's role in helping them find the alternatives? I mean, the language you hear a lot is reshoring, uh, investing in manufacturing. Uh, the majority leader yesterday threw some cold water on that because there's a big China bill, I guess, going through the, the Senate saying that it needs to come from the private sector and kind of government dollars aren't going to solve this. What's your thinking on, on some of this? I think the government, when it comes to the defense part, getting them out of the supply chain, has a role to play in incentivizing that and making it uh, uh, more practical. To, to do so, because it has to be done. Now, in the private sector, you know, I had to hear what the majority leader is talking about there, but when it comes to the Defense Department, I think we ought to be helping uh, make that change. And is this a big concern for you on the high end of manufacturing? We hear a lot about semiconductors, or on the low end where you, you know, have uh, one kind of source for something that's not, you know, kind of advanced manufacturing, but still pretty critical. Uh, for making whatever uh, you know, military platform is required. I want them completely out of our supply chain, period. You know, we, as we just learned in this country, we, we couldn't even produce these when we started this pandemic. And the that's PPE. Yeah. yeah, PPE. Just in all sorts of things that we found out we are completely dependent on China for. And we have to be mindful, China is our adversary. They are openly acknowledging they intend to dominate the world economically and militarily in the not too distant future. And they're boasting about it right now. So for us to sit there and be naive and think we don't have to, to worry about them being in our supply chain is foolish. Well, I think there's, yeah, there seems to be an emerging consensus that we should not be dependent on them uh, for supply chain. And, and you're absolutely right, COVID uh, brought that home to I mean, all Americans. Uh, the language you're using, though, I mean, do you use the Cold War analogy? Are we in another Cold War with China? This seems to be the not debate. Not yet, but we could get there if we're not careful. Uh, I want to shift two more things before we have to close out. Um, one is Afghanistan. Um, as you're aware, the Biden administration is reviewing troop levels and our commitment to Afghanistan. There's a political process going on as well, trying to get negotiations with the Taliban to have some sort of uh, political agreement to accompany a decision on the security front. What advice do you have to Secretary Austin and the Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and our troop presence there? Trust but verify. <laughs> Trust but verify. All right. Well, those Reagan are words point. that resonate in this room. That's right. What do you mean I by just, that? I, don't, I do not trust the Taliban. So if they're going to enter into an agreement that the Taliban's involved in, we have to have some means of verification that that agreement's going to be enforceable and, and worth uh, entering into. And I'm very apprehensive when it comes to the Taliban. We, we cannot, after spending two decades of blood and treasure to keep this country safe from what could happen in that, in that part of the world, we can't just walk away and not expect that void to be filled again by the same element. In our survey, uh, there are about, I would say, two-thirds of those polled, certainly uh, the majority, felt that we should keep troop levels the same or higher in Afghanistan. Does that surprise you? Is that what you hear in the third district of Alabama? Yeah, yeah. And we have to remember right now, we've got roughly 2,500 uh, troops there as part of the coalition. It's a little bit larger as far as the coalition. As far as I'm concerned, and since they're not doing the fighting, they're in a backup row. Right. It's, it's a good investment and a relatively inexpensive investment to keep them there, to keep from having to send massive troops back over there in the future to fight. So uh, 
I would have to have some pretty serious convincing that we need to take that out uh, and run the risk of being back over there again in, in a decade with massive expenditures. Well, let's go back to you as, as somebody who is pretty sophisticated and knowledgeable on, on, on the voting in committee. One, do you anticipate this discussion, Afghanistan presence, being a, a debate in the Armed Services Committee? It was a bit last year, I, I believe, and, and there was even tension with the Trump administration on, on this point. Um, how do you see that playing out? I don't know. I, uh, the administration uh, briefed us last week in a classified brief on, on this, and I don't think they've made a decision on what they're going to bring to us, but they are looking at the possibility of, of, of leaving. Uh, you know, they've set some, I think there's a date coming up that's, that's pushing them. That they're supposed yeah, to be the May some, date that the, that the uh, President Trump had put in place, and right. have to. So they're they're, but they've already told us they can't hit that date. Uh, just no way. So I don't know where they're going to go with this. I'm 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 confused. Hmm. Um, I'm curious when you when you think about Afghanistan um, and and the overall uh, view of Americans uh, to Afghanistan and Iraq, um, how you respond to those who critique your outlook by saying you're, you're just backing you know, endless wars or forever wars, language that both Republicans and Democrats uh, use. Uh, how do you respond to them? I don't look at what we're doing now in Afghanistan as being at war. Uh, we're, we're basically keeping that place on stable footing right now. Like, again, those, the 2,500 troops over there are in a backup row. Uh, they're not at, out back up in the sense they're supporting the, the Afghanistan National Security Forces. It, exactly. Uh, so I don't see this as an endless war. I see it as, as us keeping troops positioned around the country, around the world, for our security, just like we've got troops in other parts of the world that aren't fighting, but they're positioned uh, to help us keep that part of the world secure. Well, no doubt. They're in harm's way, though. They I mean, are. Absolutely. They are. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the same as our troops in. Uh, let's say Korea, for example, right. or certainly in Japan. I mean, there's always a risk when you're forward deployed as a, uh, uh, as a U.S. Uh, service man or woman. But uh, there's a lot more risk in Afghanistan, no doubt. There is. There is. Um, let me ask you, we got, we got two more issues before uh, I want to hit on be before we close out. Um, our survey hit on trust in the military. We always ask this, you know, how much trust and confidence uh, do you have in the military? We found that it's falling year over year. Uh, since we started doing this in 2018 to now, that number has fallen by 14 percentage points. Why do you think that is? My guess is it has to do with a lot of what we see in the media and, and the left's activity around the, the country and when the troops have had to be called in to, to tamp down some of this activism. Um, I, I don't like the way the military has been characterized in those events. Um, but I, that's all I can imagine. I can just tell you, in 3rd District of Alabama, they're held in very high esteem. So <laughs> I can't speak for these other crazy parts of the country. So you're not, you're not concerned about this? No, I'm, I'm really not. No. Um, all right, last question before we wrap up and let you go back to your other, uh, other business uh, as the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, you mentioned beforehand that you signed a letter with uh, Chairman Adam Smith, a bipartisan uh, letter. Uh, good to see uh, characteristic of the Armed Services Committee. Uh, with respect to National Guard right. uh, present in the Capitol, obviously after January 6th, um, violence there, attack on the Capitol, uh, we've had that National Guard presence sustained. Uh, what did you write with Adam Smith and why? We, we sent a letter just saying uh, that there is no threat that justifies the troops being uh, around the Capitol any longer, and the fencing. It looks like you're in a green zone uh, in Iraq around the, the capital, and it's just not justified. It never was justified. Uh, the fact is, this is a police action. The, the Capitol Police and the, and the D.C. Police should be taking care of any concerns they've got, but literally there are no threats. We've gotten classified briefings that justify the troops being there, and I've always been bothered by them being there because this is not the purpose of the National Guard. This is a police matter. Uh, I want them all gone. Uh, I. I'm okay in working in the bipartisan matter uh, with the chairman to have some residual group there. But even this commission that General Honore chaired for Speaker Pelosi has said that the fencing should be gone and the troops drawn down. They, they want some residual number of troops, a few hundred, 
but nobody can justify 5,200 guardsmen being around the capital uh, toting their weapons. Uh, That's why we have in Iraq and Afghanistan. Exactly. It's insane. And it just sends a terrible signal to the world that we're worried about our capital. We're not worried about the capital. You know, uh, that one riot was not bigger than many of the protests we have every year around Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is an overreaction, and I personally think a lot of it's political posturing by the Democrat uh, leadership in the, in the Congress. Did you get a reply to that letter? Yeah, they're starting to draw down. I mean, it, 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 uh, because there was no defense, uh, they're already starting to draw them down. Congress so it made a difference. All right. Congressman <laughs> Mike Rogers, we thank you so much for joining us today at the Reagan Institute. We look here. forward to welcoming you back and, of course, at the Reagan National Defense Forum That's in right. December 2021. That's right. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Hoff, Policy Director at the Ronald Reagan Institute. Let me begin by thanking Roger and Congressman Rogers for that wonderful discussion. We'll continue the conversation now with a panel discussion on the results of the recently released Reagan National Defense Survey. The survey is an annual public opinion poll commissioned by the Ronald Reagan Institute each year. This year's survey polled 2,500 American adults and it was conducted last month in February. Our goal with the survey is to shed light on the views of the American people across a wide array of defense, foreign policy and national security issues. And we'll be discussing the survey today with our distinguished panelists, Senator Jim Talent and Admiral Gary Ruffhead. Senator Talent is a former US Senator from the state of Missouri. He was a member of the House of Representatives prior to serving in the Senate and served on both the House and Senate Armed Services Committees. He currently serves as a commissioner on the US China Economic and Security Review Commission. Admiral Ruffhead is the former Chief of Naval Operations Prior to that, he held six operational commands, including commanding both the US Atlantic and Pacific fleets. He served as co-chair of the 2018 National Defense Strategy Commission and is a distinguished military fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel. Great to be here. Great, great to be with you, Rachel. Well, let's start by, by diving right into the data of the latest Reagan National Defense Survey there are a lot of interesting takeaways to unpack, but one of the most alarming um, has been the diminishing trust and confidence in the military. While the military still remains at the top of the list of trusted institutions that we polled, there's been a pretty significant 14 point drop since we started doing the survey in 2018 uh, in the number of Americans who report that they have a great deal of confidence and trust in our military. You know, and that decline really cuts across all demographic groups from um, voters in different parties, age demographics, gender as well. Um, and, and across all of those demographics, it was a, a double digit fall just in the last two years. What do you make of this trend? Uh, Senator Talent, let me start with you. How concerned should we be about it? And, and what are some of the implications? Oh, I think we should be moderately concerned. Um, the military has had a great deal of trust compared to the other institutions of government and still does. I mean, it's, it's well above Congress, the presidency, the Supreme Court, et cetera. They did not fall over the last year, but on the other hand, they were so low that uh, particularly the Congress, it's, it's kind of hard to see how much lower they could get. So I, I'm moderately concerned about it insofar as it, as it reflects the fact that it's very, some of the polarizing social issues uh, in our society today inevitably leach over into aspects of how the Department of Defense handles its personnel policies, or it's a, it is a community on its own in a way. And uh, if, if I thought it was that, uh, I would be more concerned. Now, as you know, Rachel, these, these kinds of controversies uh, have always been around. I remember in the 90s, we were arguing on the House Armed Services Committee about whether uh, military base commissary should be able to sell Playboy. 
uh, or, or whether chaplains should be free to, to pray however they wanted outside the chain of command, particularly on naval vessels. I know that's something Gary had to deal with himself. So, and, and, and no matter what position the department takes or an administration takes, there is a group of people who are going to suspect that the department's going rogue. Uh, so if, if that was it, I think I would be concerned. I know Gary has, a, it, it could just be a natural sort of result of the fact that we're not seeing as much about how we're kicking rear ends in the Middle East right now. Admiral Ruffhead, let's turn to you. What do, what do you make of the, the trend of diminishing confidence in the, in the military as an institution and, and um, you know, what it, what it means? Uh, uh I would say that it's a it's a bothersome trend, uh, but I would also add not unexpected, uh, as Senator Talent mentioned, uh, no longer in the in the limelight of, of the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, where you had constant uh, images and and anecdotes emerging from that. Not not just the competence of the military, but also the the human dynamic of. Uh, uh, troops returning home from deployments and the and the emotional reactions of families. Uh, so I, I think as as that has waned, the the tendency has been on reports of the military. They tend to be on bad things that have happened in the military, whether it's a sexual assault, a series of accidents that call into question the operational competence. So I think that that has uh, been a factor. Um, the other thing I think, um, and, and this is something I've long been concerned about, is the, the, the more and, and the increasing role of retired senior military officers in political campaigns, which when they take that active role, if someone doesn't agree with the political um, uh, party with whom they are affiliating, then that I think has the potential to translate into questioning, you know, what is the military doing? Because I think we've lost the, the sense of, of um, you know, the military being apolitical. And, and the other thing that comes into play is that there is not as much contact between those who are serving in the military and the population writ large, a very small percentage and, uh, and, and many of the individuals who go in the military, it's becoming more geographically defined than it has been. Yeah, and on that latter point, if I could, Rachel, sure. I, it would be interesting next year to try and get a good sample of military families uh, to see what they think. I, I would be very concerned if I saw evidence that, um, for example, that those who had served in those families were not recommending volunteering to the younger people in that family. In other words, uh, you know, we might talk to the like, Blue Star families about this and, and other organizations, um, but we don't know that from the day to here, and I hope it's not true. Yeah. Yeah. Rachel, just the other one I you know, to recommend where I think your excellent survey might want to explore in the coming years is really di you know, parsing by demographic, by age, um, mm -hmm. because that I think is, is a very telling. Uh, yeah, we do have some of those, um, those data points as, as, as I dig more into the survey results myself just out last week, um, a lot of the um, trend is, is when broken down by age is particularly interesting and concerning, especially voters um, who were surveyed in the poll under 30, Americans under 30, um, the number who report a great deal of trust and confidence in the military is um, under 40% at this point. And so certainly um, when we think about kind of recruiting for the all volunteer force, especially from that demographic, that, that might be, um, <clears throat> you know, there's certainly some, some kind of aspects of that that are, are problematic. How do you think, you know, you both point to some reasons why this trend might have emerged over, over the last couple of years. We only kind of identified it as a trend in the survey this year. And I think uh, you point to some ways that we might um, flesh out our questions with regard to especially military families or even, even just asking, 
asking why, you know, reasons for, for the declining confidence. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of, of data uh, in the survey itself about uh, that declining trust and confidence in the military, I think it's important for us to think through why it matters and what to do about it. So any thoughts you could share on that? What, is it, what does it mean for our society if, if the American people are um, have diminishing trust and confidence in the military, even as the most trusted institution, you know, and certainly lackluster confidence in the other institutions? And then what can, what can we do about it to, to, um, to revive some of that confidence in, in, in our military in particular? Senator Talent, do you have any? Well, I think if the reason that trust is going down is that they are concerned about operational competence type of issues. And let's face it, there have been accidents and there have been problems. That you can fix relatively easily because you just fix the problems, which you should be doing anyway, right? If the reason trust is going down is because they no longer trust the integrity of the leaders of the department to, uh, you know, to stand up for their mission and to be focused on what they're supposed to be doing, that's a different level of problem. And I think the way we to address it is um, is is for is, is if the leaders would read Yuval Levin's new book, A Time to Build about what is happening to institutions, broadly speaking, in our country. Uh, I, I love the podcast that Roger did with him, and I got the book, read it. Gary, you might want to look at it if you haven't. It's really good. And he makes the point that uh, institutions are declining in part because too many people in the institutions are, instead of understanding and believing in the institutional norms as much as they believe in the agenda that they want to accomplish, they're using the institution as platforms to advance ambitions that are not related to the goals of the institution. Now, I don't think that's anywhere near as big a problem with the department as it is in other places. But Gary's mentioning about, you know, retired officers being publicly out in politics. People begin to suspect what's, you know, what's going on here. So I think generally everybody in government would be well advised to start thinking, to be as loyal to the norms of the institutions as they are to the goals they're trying to achieve. It's kind of like a golfer, like Tiger Woods. He desperately wants to win. But one of the things I believe among the, the golfers on the tour is they are just as strongly loyal to the rules of golf. So, that, so in other words, they would reject the opportunity to win by cheating, I hope so. See, and that's what we've got to promote, I think, all throughout government. I think the department does a much better job of that than, than, than the political institutions. And I've said that over and over again, but maybe we need to look at whether we can do it better. Admiral, your thoughts on, on why this matters and what we can, what we can do to, to counteract it? Yeah, I, th I think it matters for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the American people need to have confidence that when our military uh, is engaged, and, um, and sent into harm's way, that, that they will be successful. Uh, that, that's key. Uh, importantly, it's, it's also uh, uh, vital for what we were talking about in the, the last round of, of discussion, that uh, parents who uh, have to be comfortable with their sons and daughters going off to serve in the institution uh, to Jim's point, that that it is um, operationally competent, that the probability of success is high, and that the foundation of the institution uh, is 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 based on ethical principles, and that their sons and daughters uh, will be well cared for, treated uh, with dignity and respect. Uh, and, and so I think that to me is, is something that we can't lose sight on because it's the young people of the country who are the military. It's, it's not the Department of Defense. It's, it's those who come from every uh, corner of, of the United States who are the military. And, and we need to make sure that that um, desire, that enthusiasm and commitment is there. Mm. You know, one of the things that this conversation raises to mind is another data point in the survey that, that has been trending downward since we started it in 2018, which is 
the confidence of the American people that the United States would win a war with a nuclear power. Um, we saw, saw that fall by double digits over the last uh, two years as well. Um, but, but despite this declining confidence in the military as an institution, or, or maybe even in our ability to, to win a war against a, a peer competitor, uh, the survey found that Americans actually don't want the US to retreat from global leadership. Um, our data show that a majority of Americans want the U.S. to be more engaged and take a leading role with regard to international events, while only one in four say that they would prefer the U.S. be less engaged and, and kind of merely react to events. Um, but one in four is a pretty sizable minority, and I think we've, we've heard I, even recently uh, that they're a pretty vocal minority so despite kind of relatively few Americans wanting the U.S. to be less engaged, um, you know, as we see these growing neo-isolationist strains on, on both sides of the political aisle, I wonder if you could help our audience think through what would it mean for the United States to be less engaged in the world? Admiral Ruffhead, we'll start with you. What are the consequences of the U.S. retreating from, from its global leadership? Well, I think the big consequence is that it really um, uh, diminishes our ability to influence events in different parts of the world. The one uh, area that your survey also points out is the increasing uh, emphasis on East Asia as being uh, a key area where the United States and our allies are facing a, uh, com a, a competitor. A significant competitor. And so uh, not being there removes opportunities, removes influence, uh, and, and calls into question whether the United States uh, can be relied upon to support our friends and allies in different parts of the world. Uh, we have not had to experience that since the end of the Second World War. Uh, and we now face a, a competitor across the, the, the breadth of, of sectors, whether it's in the military, uh, political, economic, and technological uh, challenges are being made to us. And if we're not out and about, then I think we cede a lot of ground to China and others who don't have the same interests and same beliefs that we do. Mm -hmm. Senator Talent, what, what would you say to, to those folks who, who want America to be less engaged? What's the, what's the best case to be made for, for American leadership? Well, I think Gary's exactly right. And so I define American leadership in the world as, as uh, moving at the forefront of events rather than reacting, as you put it. In other words, trying to anticipate threats to the United States, to the homeland, or to our vital national interests and try to deter or defuse them before they get to the point where we are put to the choice of either having to undergo some tremendously risky sacrifice to protect ourselves or forfeit our security or our rights. I mean, that's a definition of strategic failure to me is when you put a president in a position where he either has to give up some tremendously important American interest or aspect of American security, or he has to to fight under circumstances that are highly disadvantageous to yeah. us. And so leadership is essential to try to avoid that. Now you have to do it right, and we don't always do it right. But I think that's what the survey is saying. Americans get that on a pretty fundamental level. I think what they don't like, and when you see, um, you see these numbers going down, is when the way our policy expresses itself is so consistently in using the armed forces uh, in combat roles, and and you know the general the, the the general and flag officers like Gary will all tell you that if 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 we are, if we are trying to express American foreign policy by consistently sending uh, our guys and gals into combat, we've done something wrong. I mean that that's the it's the foundation of all the other tools but we should be protecting our interests and in leading through diplomacy, economics. I mean, there's a whole range of tools. And I, you know, the American people don't want a lot of long and difficult wars and I don't blame them. But I do think they want us to be 
uh, at the forefront of events. And I think the survey indicates that. You know, Rachel, I was actually um, uh, quite buoyed by the fact that the, the positive, what I would call the positive comments about uh, being engaged, being forward, uh, having strong alliances. I think um, I, I actually was expecting the numbers to be a bit lower. So I, I think, you know, that's a good uh, uh, signal. But it's also important that, that we work on those relationships and that we make the hard decisions because a lot of uh, the ability to be out there doing things, to be based, to be working with allies, um, you know, comes at a cost. And, 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 I, and I know we'll get into some of the budget issues later on, but, um, you know, it is important to be there. You know, the, the world is a big place. And, uh, and if you are not forward, it can take a long time to get there. And particularly with some of the, uh, the peer competitors that we're dealing with, um, they'll fill that vacuum. Right, and I, I think you're, you're right to bring up um, you know, the support that we saw in the survey, speaking of allies and partners and, and, and even our, our base structure, military base structure around the world, over 60% over majority support for, for maintaining those military bases overseas. And, and in fact, it was over 60% in, in both parties. So clear bipartisan support there too, which I think shows that Americans don't just support the idea or the concept of American leadership in principle, but even kind of when when being asked, um, you know, in practical terms, what that means, um, they understand the need for for exactly the kind of leadership and forward presence that you both point to. Mm -hmm. I want to shift gears a little bit, <clears throat> and uh, Admiral, you brought up the the Indo Pacific Theater, where you both have have quite a bit of experience, and our survey has all sorts of really rich data on China in particular. And of course, we know that that inside the Beltway in, in Washington D.C. Um, leaders on, on both sides of the aisle have been sounding the alarm on, on the threat posed by China for several years now. And, and of course, China was the major focus of, of um, the Trump administration's national defense strategy a few years ago and, and really provided um, uh, kind of the, in the framework that the Biden administration provided with their interim national security guidance, um, China was front and center as well. But our survey our survey points to kind of an emerging consensus among the American people as well, um, with a strong plurality for the first time identifying China as the country that poses the greatest threat to the United States. Um, more than twice as many people say, say China than the next country on the list, uh, which is Russia. And Russia topped the list when we started doing the survey in, in 2018. Um, tell us what you think this trend uh, means for the policy conversations around the China question here in Washington. Uh, Senator Talent, let's start with you. Then I'd better unmute myself. <laughs> they had a uh, uh, loud motorcycle outside my window, and so I muted myself for a minute. Uh, yeah, I think the American people, um, you know, they, it's, it's amazing how they figure things out uh, on a broad level. And they figured out that China is a tremendous threat. I mean, it just, it is. And we, you know, we have a classic case here of a, of a rising hegemon, if you will, that has defined its national interests in a way that, that is just mutually exclusive, not only with the way the United States defined its own interests, but with American security and indeed with an international order uh, that is based on norms and assumes that countries are going to comply with the norms and try and resolve disputes peacefully. I mean, it's now clear that China's ambitions are global, that they want to replace that order with one where the big dogs get the benefits and they're considered by everybody to be the biggest dogs and they get the most benefits and the rules such as they are, uh, are adapted to benefit China's view of its own national interests. And I think Americans are seeing this in a lot of different ways, just as they're seeing it on the Hill. And uh, they're saying, we don't like this. Um, and I think it's very healthy. It is very bipartisan. Now, I, I know the survey says that, for example, Democrats view, still view Russia as more dangerous. And we have to be fair here. I mean, it's not like Putin's intentions are good for the United States, but what 
what I think people are coming to understand is that the Chinese are the greater threat because they're so much more powerful. I mean, and Putin understands that although he has been very good at sharpening certain tools of power and the ones that have allowed him to, I mean, he's very shrewd. He's played a weak hand extremely well. But the Chinese are much, Beijing under the Chinese Communist Party is an across the board threat. And uh, my concern, I'd love to know what Gary thinks, is that deterrence is failing in the South China Sea. I think Admiral Davidson has been sending that message in very responsible ways, and I think he's right. Admiral, do you want to react to that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with what Jim said, but I would also say that it has now in the last couple of years in particular, uh, that that China is is becoming much more aggressive. You know the the old line of "We'll bide and hide" that has been put aside uh, by Xi Jinping. He has a long runway, uh, given the fact that he's you know, abolished any constraints on on how long he can rule. So uh, they're moving very very quickly. They've also shown that they can be quite brutal when it comes to human rights. And I think that's something that has piqued the interest of the public more so than in the past. They have shown that they are willing to abrogate agreements and not even blink, whether that's uh, the law of the sea in the South China Sea and where they expanded the, the features and built military bases in those vital sea lanes or their policies with regard to Hong Kong that are becoming more aggressive every time. So I, I think we're seeing that. The other thing is that, um, you know, Americans don't like to be in second place. And we're seeing significant uh, technological uh, ad advancements in China. Uh, clearly much of what they have, have had as a foundation was based on intellectual property that was uh, gained illicitly. But China is now moving. Uh, they are innovating. They are able to deploy a lot of the technology. And, and they're moving very qu quickly. And I think that, that adds to this unsettling um, uh, feeling that Americans have. And, and China is also um, shaking their neighbors. Uh, quite a bit. And, and, and to go back on what we were talking about earlier, that's why it's so important for the United States to be present in these vital areas um, that are, are going to be contested. I, 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 sure wish we had, I sure wish we had that 350 ship Navy or even what we really need is, uh, is one much, I, I just wish we had more ships in indo -Pacom. <laughs> Gary, I wrote a column a few years ago, put it in Master Review. I just entitled it, We Need More Ships, exclamation point. It's a maritime domain. I mean, <clears throat> they get that. Uh, they're building a ship every six weeks. And, you know, it's, it's not now. We're not going to match them in numbers. I, I, you know, I'm not. But there are certain classes of vessels that we need to get in there. And the Navy is responding. But let's face it, we're, you know, we're behind in the game. We should have been doing this five years ago at the latest, yeah. what we're doing now. And in addition to that, and, and uh, next week, uh, I co-chaired a Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on uh, the implications for the United States of China's Belt and Road, which is a very, very broad and comprehensive approach to uh, extending their influence uh, yes. uh, around the world. And, uh, you know, we can focus on the Navy appropriately, and you'll always hear me cheering from the sidelines, uh, given my background. But China has become uh, the maritime power. You know, we can talk about sizes of the Navy, but uh, whether it comes to shipbuilding, when it comes to shipping companies, when it comes to operating ports and vital areas of the world, uh, China is the maritime power. And, uh, you know, we've kind of let that get, get by us. Um, we are not going to build a huge merchant fleet, but we have to think about how we can contend with the type of influence and ability to influence events that China is going to have because of what they've been up to over the last couple of decades.
It's a perfect example, Rachel, and I'm, I'm not letting you get a word in edgewise. It's a perfect example, the point I was making before about how the strength of America's armed forces are the foundation of the other tools that should be the, the primary go-to tools to express our policy. So I, you know, I'm convinced that the, the advantages lie with the United States and its allies in the long term in this competition with China. We have enormous reservoirs of strength we're just beginning to tap. But what we have to do is to deter them from channeling and expressing their ambitions in, in, in aggressive forms. And Gary is right. They, they have been sending signals under Xi and particularly the last couple of years. I mean, they stepped up the pressure on Japan in the, uh, in, in the Sakhalin Islands, uh, on Taiwan, obviously. And the incident with India doing that at the same time and, and pressuring all, they won't allow their neighbors to, to, to extract any of the minerals, even, when they're, even within their exclusive economic zones. All this is occurring at once. It's, it's why I'm concerned that, that deterrence on a fundamental level is moving away from us. And so we don't have time for the, for the alliances and, and the economic tools to work. Well, as I try to hold my own with a, an admiral and a senator here. Let me, let me, I, I want to dig in a bit on several of the points that, that have just come up, whether it's freedom and democracy or our military investments, particularly in, in emerging technologies. But first, I want to kind of zoom out, you know, having, having uh, talked through the particulars of the China threat that you, as you have, do you think that there's sufficient concern about China? You know, we, our, we, I point to the trend over the last few years of our survey, China now the strong plurality over any other countries, Russia coming in at second, but it's still just over one in three Americans that identify China as the top, as the top uh, concern, the greatest threat to our nation. Um, two in three Americans, that means, chose another country, whether that's Russia, Iran, North Korea, or I think it's I think it's 25% of the survey who chose somebody other than one of those four countries. Um, so my question is, is there enough concern about China to motivate the kind of long-term generational um, policies that are needed for strategic competition? You know, obviously thinking back to the Reagan era and the Cold War, no no Americans would have would have had trouble understanding who who our greatest competitor was. Uh, do you think we're there yet, or is there still ground to gain? Either one of you can. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 here we go. Okay. Um, I, I think that the awareness and the consequences of uh, China's policies are becoming more apparent. People are becoming more aware. Uh, clearly in Washington, my sense is that on both sides, there is a, there's significant concern. Uh, I think that there is an urgent need to talk more broadly about what the challenges are and what the consequences are, not just in the security realm, but in uh, who will lead in technology, who will set the standards for the uh, digital ecosystem that we're going to be living in, uh, how will China use its influence on neighbors um, and, and what will its effect be on, on how we can engage uh, globally. So I, I think that's rising. My concern is that uh, China is, is pretty much up to speed and moving quickly. And uh, do we have the ability to um, increase that level of awareness? Because as your survey pointed out, I mean, um, as, as you talked more in the survey about specific issues, it seemed like people were saying, yeah, I, now I see that as a bigger problem. So I think it's hugely important that there be a, a dialogue with the American people that you know, lay out what the consequences are. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could not agree more, Rachel. And I, you know, one of my big gripes about the post-Cold War presidents, and I've served you know, at the same time as a number of them, is that none of them have done what was done in the Truman Eisenhower years 
to explain on a strategic level to the American people what is at stake, what our basic missions are in the world, and why it matters to them. And so to the extent that the people are a little confused about this, I really don't think it's their fault. I don't, I don't think, I mean, we've had presidents who talk about this, the certain values, or we're gonna do this, or, and that's fine. But, uh, you know, we need somebody to create some real strategic clarity and, you know, we haven't had it. And um, I think a lot of our problems are downstream of that. Um, and by the way, it's going to include not forgetting about the other threats. I mean, the American right. people, Russia still is a threat. I mean, you look at what they're doing in the Arctic. Uh, they just signaled an intention to basically charge people if they want to uh, if they want to ship along, charge other countries if they want to ship along. They're basically declaring sovereignty the way the Chinese are. Iran is an ongoing threat in the Middle East. We have to walk and chew gum at the same time. But I, will the American people sacrifice enough? Yes, if it's explained to them, and particularly if it can be done in a bipartisan way. That's good news because of the response to China on the Hill has been very, very bipartisan. Right. Leadership matters. Um, I want to shift gears a bit, um, pivoting off of the, the China numbers in the survey. When we asked uh, respondents in particular about their concern over China across a wide range of issues, human rights violations ranked number one on the list with 85% of Americans concerned. Um, for Russia, three and four respondents are concerned about the poisoning of opposition leaders and the suppression of dissent uh, in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Um, a majority of respondents in the survey favor increasing government spending on promoting freedom and democracy around the world. Are you surprised by how high some of these numbers are? Um, Senator Talent, let's, let's start with you. As a you know, former elected official, um, you know, it should, should we be surprised by that? Or is this kind of part of the American, American I, way? I'm not. I've always thought, I've always thought that a policy of, of strong, robust leadership abroad, including building the various tools of power, uh, would be popular with the American people. Now, I think from a political standpoint, and I'll speak it's the one area of expertise I have here that you two don't have. I can speak as a politician. Uh, I think people support those things, uh, but those are not for most voters in the, in the absence of an immediate cognizable significant threat to which they're responding, like 9-11. Those issues are not going to be listed in the top 10 of the, of the issues they, they would vote on. So if you're a political leader, what this means as a practical matter is you have the freedom to do the right thing and to lead in a robust way. And the American people will support you and will support the sacrifices involved. But it's not like they're gonna throw you out of office if you don't, if, because there are other issues that are more important to them. This is what I always, always said. So do the right thing. You know, it's, it's not gonna hurt you politically to do it. But you're probably in the absence, again, of some kind of recognition that an enormous national effort is needed in response to a threat. I don't think they're going to say, well, you know what, I, I like that person for other reasons. So even though they're too isolationist for me, I'm going to vote against them. Generally speaking, they won't. Mm -hmm. Admiral Ruffin, anything you would, would add on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, on the issues of human rights and you know, poisoning of opposition leaders, you know, Americans are good people. Um, you know, we believe in fairness. We believe, you know, I mean, we, I'm sure there's some excursions we could talk about, but, but the fact of the matter is that we like to be fair. We like to be kind. Uh, we're extraordinarily generous, um, you know, as a, as a military leader that's been engaged globally for a couple of decades. It just, it was always uh, impressive uh, to see the goodness that our young men and women bring into various communities. Uh, no other uh, military on the planet does that. Um, and so I, I think that, that that's just part of who we are. Um, and, and I do believe 
that there, uh, there are opportunities uh, to engage on multiple levels in multiple ways around the world, not just militarily, uh, that can continue to showcase that American trait that I think is so unique. And, and, so I, and, and that's reflected in, in how people responded to your survey. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got just over five minutes left and I've got one topic uh, left to address, which involves something we hit on earlier, um, defense spending and in particular our investments in emerging technologies. Um, our survey shows that uh, three quarters of Americans support increasing defense spending um, to Senator Talent's point maybe about prioritizing issues. We, we, we do learn from the survey that uh, it ranks below healthcare and education as priorities for increased spending. Um, but standalone, do you support increasing the defense budget? Um, strong majorities of both parties. Um, whoa, I am getting some weird, sorry, we'll have to edit this part out. Some video just started playing. Yes, in, my, in the background, hold, if you, if, can we pause? Oh my gosh, could you hear that? I'm not hearing anything. Okay, I, it's turned off now. I think I have, have another, Rachel, I have another computer in the room yeah. and it started, I think it's playing Mike's speech, Mike McCall's speech or Mike that, Rogers' speech. Hold that's on. what happened. I had the YouTube up in a different window and it just started playing. Um, so I'll let Senator Talent deal with that and we could edit this part out. You must've closed it, Admiral. <laughs> Yeah, I, you, guys, a smart you, move. you guys need some Zoom stupid study or something. I know. <laughs> oh, that was, oh, that was uh, a little Gary should answer this question, by the way, because all I'll do is rant about the top line. You both know that. So Gary should answer this question. Well, um, well, love for you both to, to weigh in, but um, I'll start up here again. Um, let's see. Um, so, and it's actually strong majorities in both parties that support increasing defense spending. So, so certainly see some bipartisanship or opportunities for bipartisanship there. Um, I actually want to ask though, particularly about the investments that we, we need to make in, in the emerging technologies piece. Americans in our survey seem very aware that the United States may not be leading the world in developing the kinds of technologies that are critical to national security in the 21st century which is of course particularly concerning in the context of strategic competition and in particular Chinese investments in those technologies. So, you know, we asked about a range of uh, technologies from robotics to artificial intelligence um, and pretty small minorities of our respondents in the teens said that we're the best in the world. Um, something like half said we're one of the best in the world but again, with regard to competition in China being the difference between the best and one of the best is pretty significant. Um, so my question for you, are these concerns justified and, and what, what can, we, can we do about it? Admiral Ruffhead, let's, let's start yeah. with you. I think they're absolutely justified. And, 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 and it's not a simple issue to get our arms around. Um, we in the United States, you know, we're the innovators, we've generated the, the great innovations that have led us into this new digi digital age. Uh, the question is, how do we implement that? And I think that's where, um, where China has moved very, very quickly, whether it's in 5G or, um, you know, they're, they're, they're using artificial intelligence in many cases, not for good things. And, um, you know, surveillance systems that have incredible technology in them, but they're, you know, they're not being used in the way that we would, would see them. So I think that that is a concern. I, I really do believe that we have to think uh, about how we bring a lot of that technology to bear. And, and it's not just in, uh, in the military. I mean, we're about ready to embark in a different way of, of, of life uh, with the digital uh, tools and, and ecosystem that we're going to live in. So we have to look at it that way, but we have to move very, very quickly. Uh, I am also concerned that um, because of the fact that, that we have allowed our educational system to uh, degrade, that we are not building the seed corn, not just to produce the people that will you know, come up with the next great innovation, 
but how how do we maintain how do we install how do we repair this new uh, ecosystem that we're going to be living in and i think that's a longer term problem that uh, often gets pushed off to the side because of our great universities and the innovation that comes from them. But when you look at um, you know, American citizens who are um, getting degrees in the very, very hard technical disciplines, the percentage is very, very small, uh, mm -hmm. too small for, for the future in which we're going to live. Senator Talent, you co-chaired a task force for the Reagan Institute that looked into some of these issues with regard to emerging technologies, innovation, workforce, and this concept of a national security innovation base. Um, so what, what, can we, what can be done about this? What, what ought the US government to do to make sure we're prepared to, to compete in the 21st century? Uh, well, there's a number of steps we can take. You know, we recommended, and I'll talk about a couple of them. I will say, I think the American people have basically got it correct in saying in a lot of areas, that we're not the best, but we are one of the best. And even in the areas where we are the best, we are in danger of losing the lead, right? Like uh, AI, right? So there's a number of things we need to do to uh, both empower and broaden the national security innovation-based ecosystem, but also coordinate it better towards the goals of national security. Uh, there's a number of things that department can do that we recommend it, but it really comes down to getting better at investing uh, dollars in outside in a flexible way outside of the traditional acquisition process in a way that uh, appeals to the incentives within the private sector in the national in the innovation base to get them to produce more innovation for national security purposes. Uh, to, Larry, uh, to Gary's point, uh, there's a number of things we need to do to increase the talent that's available. And we suggested like a STEM core, as you know, where you know, we would, uh, the government would provide benefits and scholarships to schools and kids who, to, to produce better STEM education, uh, na a national security innovation visa, uh, so that we are, we are able to continue to get the best minds from around the world in these national security area. So there's a number of things that we need to do. I'll just add though, Rach, that at the same time as we do this, and it's vitally important, obviously, uh, not just for military purposes, but also in terms of the economic side of the competition. Uh, we also have to invest adequately uh, in the kind of presence around the world that will support the leadership we've been talking about. So from the standpoint of the department, and Admiral Ruffhead knows my view on this, the department wants to focus on capability, and I get that, acquiring the technology, but we also need some capacity. And we need to have people in that theater. If, if, if we want our allies to think of us as the leaders, they got to see us. Uh, Gary, uh, Jerry Hendricks's new book on, on, on to provide and maintain a Navy documents how our how our presence in ports in Indo-PACOM and around the world, naval presence has gone down and down and down. And the consequences of that in terms of, of our diplomacy, our credibility in the region. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think related to that too, Rachel, if we have time, um, you know, we have to, uh, I think, change the way that we work with our very, very close allies uh, on moving into these new technical uh, capabilities. Um, we tend to be very restrictive, um, but I think we have to look at that. We also need to change our mindset as, as we look at introducing new capability to be more focused on outcomes than we are on process. We've become uh, mm -hmm. so tied to process that it has slowed down the ability for us to bring things to bear quickly. Um, you know, there are going to be failures, but we can't come to all stop every time there's a failure and then add another layer of process to it to make sure we don't fail again. And I think that we have really backed ourselves into a corner and it's hampering what has long been the, the great spirit of innovation that, that, that Americans have been known for. Well, I and I think that ties back to where we started the conversation that when we, when we Think about how to restore trust and confidence in the military, certainly providing them the resources 
capabilities, capacity they need to, to do the jobs we ask of them um, would, would be a good first step. Um, let me thank you, Senator Talent, Admiral Ruffhead, for a very engaging conversation today. And thank you, all of you, uh, for joining us as well. Thank, thank you. you. And it was fun.